afternoon. I know, I know it was a little bit of a long one, but we had our business meeting. Praise God for that. Got a lot of things to, to be able to talk about. God is good to our church. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And are you amazed? Amen. Are any of you amazed at what you've seen uh, concerning the numbers, what God's doing? It's incredible what the Lord's doing. Amen. And what he has done this whole time that we've been in our uh, services and, uh, and just watching how God's doing work with us. And so, we look forward to what's coming. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, I'll give you a quick building project update. We need two more approvals, actually three. On Monday, we're supposed to get our approval for our solid waste, um, which should be no problem. We'll get that done on Monday. And then we're waiting for two from the architect. So that will be done by this week. It should be done by this week to allow us to get our occupancy permit. We can get that same day to get in our building. This is our last Sunday service here at Albuquerque Bible Church. Amen. And so we're so thankful for Albuquerque Bible Church Amen. and all that they did for us. Amen. And how they've just been a blessing and we love them so dearly. We're so grateful for Pastor Padilla, his wife, and his congregation. Just they mean so much to us. And so keep in mind, we'll be next Sunday. We'll be having church services. We'll start at 10 o'clock Sunday school. And then we'll be doing our 11 o'clock worship service um, right there at the new building on 3030 Todos Santos Street. If you're watching online, 3030 Todos Santos Street, Albuquerque, Mexico, 87120. Praise God. Amen. We'll be there. Come and join us. Come and see us. Come and be part of what's going on with our church. Our church is doing some amazing things through the Lord. Amen. And it can't be done on our own. It has to be with God and has been with God. And so that'll start next Sunday. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Amen. Praise God. All right. We're just uh, finishing up some building projects on the inside of our new building. We need to get done. We need to get the stage completed. The lighting done. The audio set up. The chairs set up. So uh, I'll be sending out the text messages this week. If you want to come by and help out, we'll need to have the auditorium and the hallways knocked and, uh, because they keep getting dirty because we keep doing construction on them. Uh, so we'll need to get all that straight and situated this week so that we can get in uh, and have our full services on, on Sunday, okay? I'm going to be excited for next Sunday. Amen. 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 Yeah, round of applause for that. Amen. I'm excited about it too, and I, I can't wait. You know, how many of you remember what it was like when we were getting uh, kicked out of our own building? Yeah. Amen. How many? It was, it was a sad day that day. I remember, uh, and I remember looking at that building and seeing all the memories and even crying, uh, seeing it empty and just realizing what God had done there. But how God used Pastor Fadia in our life. Uh, you know, it was a good, good cry. It was one of them changing of the chapters, and uh, it's been.
been incredible. This August, we will have celebrated 10 years of being to be in the Bible Baptist Church. Amen. Praise God for that. And uh, if you're faithful to the Lord, he's faithful to you. Amen. Praise God for that. All right. Those are all the announcements I have for the building. Do you have anything on the building, brother? No. All right. Uh, I got another. And uh, you'll see it, but we may cut announcements off. You might not see me up here doing announcements. We might have another form of communicating that to you. We want to continue to progress in uh, the way that we do services. Amen. And, uh, and so just be praying about pastor and how we're going to do that. I already know what we're going to do, but I need some volunteers. I need some. Let me just say this. If you're upbeat, if you don't mind being in front of the camera, if you don't mind, you know, if, if you're just one of those personalities, come see me. So you can fill in the rest of it. Amen. And so, and then uh, that was also one that I was looking at possibly having. So we'll see. But just if you want to be in, involved in that, let me know. Um, so we'll be doing that. Also, um, and I didn't get Andres's um, information on this. Is Ryan here? Did he leave? He said no. Okay. I didn't get Andres. Okay, so then maybe you might want to just go back there and see what you can take. Okay, and whatever that's over food, Brother Richard, we can make sure that we put it in the fridge uh, for them. Okay, they said, but they said they have a ton of extra meat back there, so take a look at it, okay? Um, and just keep in mind that we're trying to, uh, we're, they're being a blessing to us, so praise God for that. All right, who has prayer requests blessings before we go forward? Any prayer requests blessings, Mom? Father Mercy, Father Mercy, Father Mercy, back tonight. Jolene, and God did, did uh, move them, and praise God for that. And let me just say this. God directly used Brother McGee for what's happening today. God said, I told you already twice, help them. And so that was uh, the moment that he surrendered to the Lord on that and decided to help them. Amen. You don't think, and you might not understand how much he means, but God is using you. It makes me want to cry because I know every person in here was directed by God to be here. When we get in our own way and our own feelings of what God's doing, we don't get to see what God
but you know, God used him to do what we're doing. To praise God for that man. All right, anybody else pray? Seven, actually. Seven. Yeah. Man. Amen. Amen. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I remember there was a moment, and I don't want to go too far, so we can get off the going and get our sermon going, but. I remember there was a moment when we, we, had, we were seeing continually about seven people coming to church, and that was like hundreds of times. It was, it was me, Sarah, Bella, Gabe, okay, the four, the sister Becky, Becky brother, uh, um, oh, eight, brother, brother Gary, sister Lou, and sister um, Shelly. I just remember thinking, how are we going to pay anything? We can't, how we, with this little group of people, we're not getting enough money coming in, like, Lord. And I had a discussion with God, and I said, God, I'm so tired. I don't know what you want me to do. I can't do that. I can't keep this open anymore. And God directly spoke to me and said, well, that's good that you finally figured it out because it's not you, it's me. And then at that moment, you heard me release it. You're not the one that built this church. This is my church, not yours. And I remember saying, okay, God, you know what? If the door's shut, the door's shut, that's your will. If the doors stay open, that's your will. But I'm going to follow you. It's no longer my problem. How many people come? How much money comes? I'm just going to trust you on it. It's your church. And I remember going to church, going to Soul Union on that Saturday, and we were going out knocking. And I remember Sister uh, Shelly, and if she's watching, she'll remember this, having the same feeling as me. We were all having it. <coughs> Pastor, uh, we're, being, we're being so faithful, and only seven, eight people are coming, and it's like no visitors, nobody shows. What are we going to do? Like, and, and, she was, and you know what I told her that morning? I said, listen, I got with the Lord, and this is what God said. God, it's his church. If the doors close, the doors close, and if they stay open, it's because he's going to keep them open. But we're going to leave it to the Lord. We're going to leave it to the Lord. And that day, I think we even spoke to a couple people there, a couple and no kidding, the, the next day on Sunday, we walked into church and we had about 37 people show up to church. And God told me at that moment, it's not your work. You just get to run it. You get to be a pastor of it. It's my work. And I learned from that moment, whatever happens in here. And so when I look at this and I see those numbers, that's not me. That's God. And we got to keep trusting the Lord for that. So, you know, to see where we're at and where we're going next week, it's just incredible. I remember that sat Saturday like it was yesterday, but I know what God's doing next Sunday. And that's incredible. I'm so thankful for those that... How many of you were here from the very beginning? Raise your hand. We have, a, we have about... wants to make me some kind of thing, a plaque or something that we can mount somewhere around the bike rack. And here's why. We want to dedicate that bike rack to Brother Jerry Fowler. Brother Jerry Fowler started coming to our church. He was one of the original members. started coming to our church on a bike at 75 years old. Could you imagine? No, I can't ride a bike now. I'm 44. Amen. <laughs> and so, uh, just to, just to dedicate uh, that to him, I want to do something special for him and put that on. Brother Jerry passed as he was still a member. I used to take care of him. And so, um, praise God for him. He was a blessing to our church. He gave faith. You know what he said? He said, nobody ever, this is how he used to talk. Nobody ever used to, nobody ever came to my door and invited me to church. Nobody ever did until you guys did. And I decided to come and visit you. And then he used to say, I used to have an old time. 
Anglican Methodist preacher. But he was really a Baptist in disguise, he said. And, and I <laughs> started laughing at him. But I love Brother Gary. He is just a blessing to us. Amen. So just reminiscing on what God's doing. Praise, praise God for that. Amen. Those are my blessings. Anybody else? Before we move on. Anybody else? Brother Cheryl? Amen. She have COVID, brother? No. She just yes. having breathing really really issues. Okay. So pray for pray for uh, Daryl and Nikki. Is her name right? Pray for Nikki and, and her oxygen levels. Um, Sarah also mentioned my brother-in-law. Can you pray for him? His oxygen levels went up. He's at ninety five percent oxygen level right now. Praise God for that. Amen. We did end up contracting pneumonia. He was actually contracting the COVID. So um, just be praying for his continued recovery. He was approved for remdesivir, so he's got three more treatments. So, so praise God for that. Amen. And uh, he should be doing good. Uh, he, he, you know, so God bless them in that. And just continue praying for him. Pray for Nikki. Anybody else? Prayer request blessing before we call it to worship team? One that's spoken. One that's spoken there. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. All right, can we get the worship team? Can I have everybody stand in as we worship Jesus here?
Can I have y'all please stand for this song? Let's worship Jesus today. Man. Make sure we clap our hands and uh, just kind of get into it, you know? Man. Let's worship God. Praise the Lord for that. 
There are good people in this world and there are bad people. Do you agree with me? There are good people in this world and there are bad people. Uh, how many of you would agree and say it's not everyone that you know, not everyone in this world is a good person? Maybe not. Amen. And how many would you also agree that not everybody in this world is a bad person? Amen. There's not always a bad person in this world. Uh, and, and, and there are also good fathers and there are bad fathers. Amen. There are good mothers and there are bad fathers. But the thing that makes a person or a father or a mother good or bad is not their actions. You say, what, well, Pastor? Just listen to me. It's not their actions, but it's simply how they view themselves. It's simply how they see themselves. Listen, church, how you see yourself will often determine who you become. Let me say this again. How you see yourself will often determine who you become. Amen. Which is essentially the message here in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, number 6, where the Apostle Paul, he's dealing with the church of Corinth. Uh, we preached about uh, some similar things in these chapters here, and he's dealing with the church of Corinth, and uh, where his main message is this. It's not found through the whole chapter, but instead his main message is found in uh, these hinge verses in chapter number 6. And it's found specifically in verse number 11. We'll put that on the screen for you if you need it. And the Bible says this. It's really found specifically in the first six words of this verse. And the Bible says there, And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Amen. So Paul's message to the Corinthian church was this. Simply by reading that verse, As such were some of you. Here's Paul's message. You're not them. You're not them. Listen, uh, 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 th this is the point of the sermon. You're not them. Being different makes a difference. Amen. Being different makes a difference. Let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get started. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this blessing of the church services. Lord, thank you for the songs and the giving and the, and the meetings. And Lord, you're just so good to us. Overwhelm me, Lord, and me with just so much blessings today on your Sunday, Lord. And I pray that we worship you the right way. We give you all that we have in our worship, our service, and our love for you, Father God, for you giving it all to us, Lord. Help the message along, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, we see uh, that this is a fascinating chapter. Paul is directly addressing the problem of the Corinth church. And here was the problem that he saw. He, he, he saw in Corinth that... Uh, that, they, that the people of uh, the, the Corinthian church saw themselves more as Corinthians than they did as Christians. Amen? They saw themselves more as Corinthians than they did as Christians. And, uh, uh, and he had already talked to them about some major issues in the church. He talked to them about disunity. And in this chapter, there was a bit of that going on. The fighting amongst each other was happening in that church. Hey, listen. There are many churches that go through that. Amen. There's many. We're not. We're not uh, an exception to that. There can be infighting amongst the people. We need to be careful with that. Uh, but Paul was addressing the unity in there. He was addressing the core issues that the Corinthians uh, and, and had. And here was the core issue that they saw themselves more as a Corinthian than they did as a Christian. And uh, what Paul was calling for was not a behavior change. What he was calling for was for them to gain a different perspective of who they were. Amen. Amen. Yeah. He wanted them to look at themselves a little bit differently. He caused them to start seeing themselves differently. And it's uh, the, the message that he gives them is more of a message about identity. Amen. And how identity changes your desires. The Corinthian, uh, uh, Corinthian uh, sorry, the city of Corinth was considered... Uh, what we call Sin City it's, uh, would be considered the Las Vegas of, the, of the, that time. Amen. Uh, uh, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Amen. That kind of thing. Amen. And, and the people of Corinth, let me tell you, they were, they were fast-paced, entrepreneurial, extremely multicultural. But let me tell you something else about them. They were also envious and arrogant and rife with sexual immorality. Amen. And so Paul had a message for the Christians that lived within that community, within that city. And his message was this. Here's the Christmas message. You're not them. You're not them. Amen? You're not them. You're not them. Being different makes a difference. When you're different, it makes a difference in your community. When you're different, it makes a difference in your surroundings, in your small group. In your city, amen? Hey, listen, Community Bible Baptist Church is called to be different. 
Amen. We're not the same as them out there and not that they're better or worse than us. Not that we're better or worse, but the fact of the matter is we're called to be different because being different makes a difference. Amen. And so uh, let me tell you something. I was born and raised in Albuquerque. How many of you were born and raised here? All your life. Spent all your life here. Uh, mom didn't raise her hand because she was born in Belen, but that's what I meant too, in New Mexico. Amen. How many of you were born and raised in New Mexico? Raise your hand. Michelle, you were born where? In Albuquerque. All right. Praise God for that. I was born and raised in Albuquerque, and the one thing that I've seen about Albuquerque is this. It can be very crazy. Were you born here? You were not born here. All right. Uh, it's crazy because people like Jason moved into Albuquerque. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. And, and uh, I can see the one thing I know about Albuquerque is it has high crime. And that's true. There's a lot of high crime right now. There's a lot of drug use going rampant right now. I know that. There's a lot of homelessness here in the city. Amen. There's a lot of sin in the city. We might not be Las Vegas. We might not be Corinth. But there's a lot of sin that's going on here in Albuquerque. Amen. But let me tell you that Albuquerque does not need another Burqueño. And if you're from here, you know exactly what I mean. Amen. If you're watching online, you know what I mean. If you're uh, like Sister Shelley from Kentucky. Oh, let me, let me say this. She doesn't know what we, what we mean. Because she was a Burqueña at one time. Amen. She was from here. And so, uh, uh, if you, uh, Albuquerque does not need another Burqueño, what Albuquerque needs is another Christian. That's what Albuquerque needs. Albuquerque needs another Christian. Somebody who lives different. And here's what I've learned, that being different in this city will make a difference to the city. Amen? Being a standout in this city for Christ will make a difference to the city of Albuquerque. You want to see change in your family? Why don't you make a difference by being different? You say, well, uh, they know who I am. They know who I know. Listen, be different, and it'll make a difference in your family. Amen? Yeah. And so here's my question to you today. How can I live as a Christian should live when I'm in the world around me and it does not live the way that I live? Well, the first thing that you're going to need to do is this. Keep your disagreements in-house. What do I mean by that? Well, you say, what does that have to do with anything, Pastor? Let me explain Back in those days, in the days of Corinth, in the city of Corinth, uh, just like today, if somebody had an issue with somebody, you know what they would do is they would say, listen, you burned me on this deal. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I went to Brother Ricardo and I purchased a chariot from Brother Ricardo, amen? And Brother Ricardo told me that on that chariot, it was supposed to have spinners. And that chariot don't got spinners. And so you burned me on that. And so you know what I'm going to do, Brother Ricardo? I'm going to take you to court and I'm going to sue you. And so back then, a lot of that kind of stuff was happening. There was people that had disagreements with each other were taking the matter to court. They were taking other Christians to the court. They were suing them for wrongdoing. You hurt me in this way. I'm going to take you to court and I'm going to sue you. And here the Apostle Paul says, don't do that. Don't take each other to court. Keep that stuff in house. Look at the Bible. What the Bible says in verse number one. Through six, the Bible says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before of the unjust or not before and not before the saints? Here's what he's saying. How can you go before the law and go to the judge and have a matter against each other when you haven't even taken it to the saints? When you have, hey, listen, if you're new here, if you're not a, a, a Christian, you don't know what it means to be saved. Let me say this a saint is someone who is saved, who has accepted Christ as their Savior. You are saved. You are considered a saint. And so in this verse, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, if you have a matter against each other, you ought not be taking it to the courts. He says there in verse number two, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world and the world shall be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? In other words, you're going to judge the world. Are you? Is this too little of a matter for you to judge here in the church? Did you have to go to the court? Verse number three says, Know ye not we should judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Did you know that you're going to judge angels at one point? So don't you think that the matters here on earth should be a little bit easier to judge? Amen. Verse number four says, If you have a judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them, uh, uh, set them to the judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak uh, to your shame. It is, it is so that there is not a wise Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between 
his brethren. And so Paul is saying here, he's saying, hey, listen, don't you know that in the end times, us saints, we're going to judge the world. We're going to judge angels. We're going to do all these things. And God isn't trusting you with that judgment. And you can't settle a dispute because a brother wronged you in the church. Because maybe you had a situation here. Because maybe somebody said something to you. Maybe somebody hurt your feelings. Maybe somebody uh, 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 did something to you that you said, hey, hey, listen, I'm taking you to court for that thing. Listen, can't you just settle that within the church among the saints, among the believers? And he, what he's saying is that we're going to be judging more important things. And so in that case, we ought to be able to judge the small matters, the small things. Amen. And so Paul's telling him this. Here's what Paul's saying, essentially. Stop taking each other to court. When you have a matter against them, a matter against somebody else, take it before the deacon of the church, take it before another brother of the church, so that they can judge the matter. Amen? Why? Because your constant fighting amongst yourselves is a terrible testimony to the secular world of who you are for Christ. You see, Paul wasn't worried about the suing. Paul was more concerned about the testimony you were going to have on the Lord Jesus Christ as you are bickering and fighting amongst brethren. Hence, keep your matters in-house. When you have an issue against each other, don't go run and take it to the world. Don't go run and put it out there in the world so that everybody out there can look and say, look at them supposed Christians. They say that they're this and they say that they're that, but they're just like us. Hey, listen, you're trying to be different and you're trying to go to them and tell them, hey, I want you to come to our church and be like us, except that we're like you. Amen. Believers need to stop bickering and fighting amongst each other. Uh, listen, it's a terrible testimony you leave the Lord when you do that. I'm so grateful for a church God has given me that has been in such unity for three years. I'm not going to say just three years. There's been a lot of division in our church off and on. It's happened. It happens in every church. But let me say that I expected the most division to come during this building project. And God has kept you and you have followed the Lord and we have stayed in unity. But it doesn't mean that it can't happen. It doesn't mean that one brother, hey, have we had disagreements? Yes, we have. Have one general contractor, and when I mean general contractor, I'm talking about the ones that run the project. Richard's general was, was the project manager for his uh, landscaping, and Ricardo was for his uh, concrete, and Ryan for his electrical, right? Oh, and, and everybody had their own little thing. When one person disagreed with somebody else, you know what they did? They, they took it amongst each other, and they brought it before the brethren, and we worked things out. It wasn't like there was not disagreements, but they kept things in house. Quit taking all your business that happens in the church amongst each other to the outside world. You say, I, I don't want to be, uh, you're not them. That's the question. Th that's the deal. You, 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 you are trying to set yourself apart from the Corinthians, but when you're taking the matters to the Corinthians, you're just like them. Amen. Amen. You're not them. You say, well, what if another Christian takes advantage of me? Right? Now, let me just clarify this real quick so that you don't think that pastor's crazy. If there's somebody that commits a violent or a massively illegal act, you have the obligation. Don't hey, let me just say this. If you witness one of your brethren in the church murder somebody else, don't call me in the church about it, okay? Call 911. Is that clear enough for you? Well, Pastor said we need to handle this amongst. Call Brother Richard, he's the deacon of the church. Brother, I just witnessed a murder right now. Call 911! Amen. Use some common sense. <laughs> Pastor, she hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm going to. Tell everybody else about it. Right? You don't understand how many times I've seen, you know, the chariot thing that we talked about, Ricardo? You told me that chariot without spinners. Oh, I talked to Gary, he told me that chariot without spinners. He told me. You know how many times that's really happened in church? Where a brother has sold a vehicle to another brother? You're not going to, oh, what? It's broken, and, and they have big, it was broken when you did, so I deducted, and you, and you didn't pay me. I'm taking you to court, I'm suing you. 
division. All of a sudden, the courts are saying, hey, Community Bible Baptist Church has a, a two members that are coming to me on a lawsuit. And you're acting just like them. You're not them. Because being different makes a difference. Amen. Take the matters in-house. Amen. You say, what if another Christian takes advantage of you? Well, here's the answer for you. Point number two. Take one for the team. Look what the Bible says in verse number six. The Bible says there, but brethren, but brother goeth to law with brother, and he, uh, sorry, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do you rather take? Well, I'm sorry. Why do you? Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? That's what he said. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why not just take the wrong? Why don't you just suffer and deal with it? You want to go take them to court? You want to be upset about it? Why don't you just deal with it and take it? Amen? How many of you like baseball? Raise your hand again. There's a few of you who like baseball. Listen, there's a thing in baseball. If you don't know about it, here's the thing in baseball. It's called this. It's called take one for the team. How many of you know what that means? Let me tell you what, what it means. Brother McGee's going to going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you too. Here it is. It's when a batter is in the batter's box, and they need, and your team needs a runner on base so that we can get that score. And the only way to get that score is get him on base first. Maybe he can get a steal at the second and then a base hit. And here's what you do. You're standing in the batter's box. You're standing in the batter's box. Sometimes they'll throw it remotely close to you. You know what a batter's supposed to do when they take one for the team? They're not supposed to go, oh! They're not supposed to go, oh! Oh! You know what they're supposed to do? That's what they do. You know what they're supposed to do? If the ball's coming close, they're supposed to lean in. Yeah. And take one for the team. You know how many times I've seen the Dodgers move out of the way and I get so angry because I'm like, take one for the team! We need you on base. Valley can testify to this. Amen. It's when a batter, instead of moving out of the way, lets the ball hit them so that they can take one for the team. Let me tell you something. I've taken one for the team many times. Let me tell you something. It's not fun. Nobody likes to take one for the team. It hurts. It causes pain. It leaves bruises. Amen. Sometimes if it's in the leg, it's a Charlie horse worse than you've ever had. You can't walk the next day, brother. Amen. And it's and listen, it, it, it's, it's, it hurts at times, but let me tell you something. If team sports can teach us to take one from the team, to, to take some hurt so that we can go ahead and be a minister to the rest of the people, then how much more should we do for Christianity's sake? How much more should we do when a Christian hurts you to just take one from the team? You say, Pastor, that's not right. Accept the wrong for the greater good is what I'm telling you. How many times have you been offended and it hurt? Many. Some of you this week. And it causes you pain. But in the end, what God is looking for us to do as believers is just take one for the team and move on. Accept the wrong. My sister Alice accepted the wrong this week. Say, what are you talking about, Pastor? I stole her lighter. <laughs> Last week, you guys remember my illustration. I borrowed it. I never gave it back. Sister, here's your lighter back. Ready? One, two, three. There we go. It's all forgiven now. Don't hold it against me, Demetrius. Accept <laughs> <laughs> it. Do you know how hard that is? I know. Do you understand what it's like to walk into a church and see that person that wronged you and they're smiling at you? <laughs> no, nah, you guys don't know what that's like. None of you guys know what that's like, right? Oh, for sure. Man, not, nobody's ever experienced that. Not in this church we have it, right? Nobody's ever walked in and seen another person and been like, oh, I can't believe she's smiling at me. <laughs> I want to just walk right over there. And for some reason, you're smiling back. <laughs> We've never been to that, right? We've never done that. None of us have ever experienced that. Here's, here's what I know and here's what I've learned. When 
you just take one for the team and accept the wrong, you see so much more favor from God for it. That's not how to do. Amen. 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 I know. Do you understand that Pastor has been wrong? Quite a bit. And then I got to come in here and say, I love you. But here's the thing. The Bible tells us that we're to have fervent charity amongst yourselves. And above all, having fervent charity amongst yourselves. You know why? For charity covereth a multitude of sins. That love that you have amongst each other helps you to get over their wrong. Because so you've drawn somebody. And let me tell you something. God's looking for us to be forgiven. Why is it that, that we have so much favor for God here? Let me tell you, why should we do that? Why should we why should we accept the wrong and forgive? I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 32, here's what the Bible says, and be kind one to another, tender hearted. Hey, have a tender heart to those that do you wrong. Somebody told me this week, when dealing with people who are hard to deal with, that one of the ways to deal with it is to have a tender To become the person they're at today. When you think on that, instead of having angry and animosity towards them, instead you have a little more pity. That's not a bad thing. You have more understanding, more tenderheartedness towards them. And then the next verse says there, the next part of that verse, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Move on. Don't just sit there and hold it. Pastor, you don't understand. I don't need to understand because the next part of this verse is all you need to understand. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. I don't need to have experience with you. God did, man. And if you've experienced it and forgiven you, you ought to do the same. To do the same, yeah, I know it is. But if we're to live amongst Christians in this world, like we're to live amongst the Christians, it'd be different. And we need to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ. And listen, I know it's not easy, but you understand that the Savior knows that feeling? And he knows what it's like to take one for the team. Amen? Aren't you glad that Jesus took one for the team, dude? Praise God, God for that. Yep. Praise God that he hung on that cross, not me. Praise God that all my sins were on him, and, and I don't have to answer for them. Praise the Lord for that. Listen, many, many believers are so concerned about their feelings and their reputation. And the reality is this, when they question God. God, don't you care that they offended me or they hurt me? And the reality is this, God cares more about his glory, about his name, about his testimony than he does about your little bitty offense. And how you react to that offense brings shame on his name at times. Or you can bring honor and glory and take one for the team. Concerned about that, but let me tell you something. God doesn't care about that. And, and, and let me let me let me say this. When we're busy fighting in victory and not taking one for the team, we can bring shame to shame to the Lord's name. And you say, I don't understand. Yes, you do. Some of you understand. You know why? Because some of you are mothers and fathers. And if you've been a mother and a father of at least two children, you've been you've dealt with this before. You've dealt with you're serving ice cream. Right? And you serve your other kid ice cream. And you're excited because he's all awesome. you gonna eat some ice cream, amen. And then the one kid, whichever one is the most stubborn, looks at the other kid's bowl and goes, You didn't give me as much as you gave him. <laughs> I'm going to tell them my kids real quick. I'm going to tell them my kids real quick. My daughter, when she was little, and I'd be like, because she was the older one, I gave her the privilege, I'd be like, split this candy bar with me between you and your brother. And then 
Gabe would be like, I'll split it, I'll split it, I'll split it. And then she'd start, no, you're not going to split it. I'm going to split it. I'll split it, I'll split it. And then she'd say, that, okay, but I'm going to watch you. And, and she'd have the candy bar like this. He'd have the candy bar like this. And then she'd be like, he, she'd be like no, move to the left. No, 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 right there. No, you're going too far over, more over. And she would direct him as he was splitting the candy bar. And then he'd finish cutting the candy bar. You know what she'd do? She'd grab the pieces and go. <laughs> okay, they're the same here. Am I right or am I lying? I'm not lying, amen. And you know what you as a father want to do or a mother when you see them bickering and fighting over the little things, you know what you want to do? You want to eat their candy bar and say, none of you get it. <laughs> Amen? I'm going to take the ice cream to my room and I'm going to kill it all. Do you feel bad that they're going to know? Because I just want them to stop fighting. Stop bickering. Same as your God amongst us. Amongst each other, amongst other Christians. Maybe not in this church. Maybe you have an odd with a Christian in another church. Quit bickering and fighting over it. Show your testimony for Christ. Take, but Pastor, they said, take one for the team, God said. Amen. You might say, Pastor, you don't understand. God is telling us today that we need to understand that we're not like them. We're not like the world. They fight among each other. They sue each other. They bicker. They complain. They undermine each other. They, they, they don't care about each other. They don't love each other. You're not them. Being different, being different makes a difference, which leads to my next point. See yourself different. See yourself differently, amen? Do you know why some fathers are, are not good fathers? Because when they look in the mirror, they don't see the good father. And many of us say things like, well, that's just who we are. Hey, here's the truth. That's not who you are. That's who you were. That's who you were. You're not that person anymore. You're not them. Why do we act like them? You're, you're not like them, but you start to see yourself acting like them, amen? You should be different, act different. Here's the problem. We act like them, and then we go to them, like I said, and we say, come be with us. But you're just like them. They don't want to be with you. They can go hang around their friends. Amen? And this is going to help you right here. This, I want, this is just going to help you. Look at the next two verses. Verse number 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and mankind, nor thieves, nor co no covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Here's what it's saying there. This verse is saying that all the people, any, anybody who has done that, let's break it down. Uh, fornicators, anybody who has any kind of sexual immorality, in or outside of uh, marriage, right? Uh, idolaters. You put something first over God, you're an idolater. Amen? You put your money over God, you idolize that money. You put your family over God, you idolize your family, your material. An idolater. The Bible says there are no adulterers. We all know what that is. When you're faithful in the marriage, you're faithful to your wife, your husband, your only spouse that God has committed you to when you break those vows and you go outside that marriage. Nor effeminate. That's talking about uh, those that are homosexual. The Bible says there. Uh, nor abusers of themselves or mankind. That's those that abuse, that, that uh, go out there and they purchase prostitutes and do these things. Uh, the Bible says thieves. Y'all know what that is. Covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. It, the Bible says none shall inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to go to heaven. Is what it's saying. Pastor, are you saying that uh, that, that that these people are not going to go to heaven? That's what the Bible says. Amen. This verse says these people listed are not going to heaven. Why? I'll tell you why. Because these people were Corinthians. Listen. How many of you have at least committed one of those sins? I, I was a thief. I might have lied. How many of you are sinners? How many of you are sinners? Raise your hand if you're a sinner. 
If you didn't raise your hand, then you're a sinner because you just lied. How many of you are going to heaven? Yeah. Every one of us? But how? How many of you committed those to any of those sins? And the Bible says you're not going to heaven if you've done that. Why are you going to heaven? Don't you think that would be a little bit... That's, that's a good question, isn't it? Why, why do the Corinthians gotta go, not go to heaven, but you get to go? You're a sinner. You've committed some of those sins. But yeah, you're going to heaven? I'll tell you why. Because you have been saved, blood washed. You are now a saint. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that. And listen, God does not allow people with sin into heaven, but you're going to heaven. So if you're a new Christian, you might be confused today. You might be like, what's going on here? I thought that you couldn't go to heaven if you have sin, but if we're sinners and they're saying that they're going to go to heaven, how are they getting to heaven? I'll tell you why. Because the reality is if you've committed a sin and you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, you've gotten saved, and now you're able to go to heaven because you're a saint. Amen? Those listed in these verses are not saved. Not because they are uh, fornicators or idolaters or adulterers, but simply because they have not accepted Christ as their Savior. The sin doesn't make them not saved. The fact that they have not accepted Christ is what makes them not saved. Because we've all sinned. We're all sinners. Right? Controversial. Pastor, are you saying that homosexuals are going to hell? I'm saying that if somebody with a homosexual sin gets saved, they, just like all of you, can get to heaven. Because their sin is the same as all of ours. Amen. Amen. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of preachers would preach otherwise. A lot of people mistreat homosexuals. I won't. Because if you guys opened your book of sins to me, I might mistreat you too. Right? These six things that the Lord hate, yes, seven is an abomination. You know what the seventh thing is? Those that sow discord among the brethren. Mm -hmm. These six things that the Lord hate, yet seven, yes, seven is an abomination. You know what people always say about homosexuality? It's an abomination to the Lord. It's always sowing discord among the brethren. You're no different. You're a sinner. Amen. Praise God you're saved by grace. Amen. Amen. Those listed in this verse are not saints, but instead they were Corinthians. And that's why they weren't going to heaven, because they were not saved. Here's the point, though, that I'm getting at. Look at verse number 11. First six words. And such were what? Some of you. And such were some of you. Listen, church, here's the point that God wants us to remember in these six words. One time, you were a sinner and living as a Corinthian. You were not going to heaven. And there are times as believers that we need to remember that as such were some of you, so that we can get off of our high horses and stop looking down at that list before us and going, oh, I'm going to no. know. As such were some of you. Amen? Get off your high horse and stop looking down at these people. But let me tell you something. Let me, let me, let me tell you, but also the other point of those six words is this. As such were some of you indicating past. As such were You're no longer that. You were that. And God wants us to remember where we came from, but he also wants to remember that you're not them. God, amen. You're different. You're not the same. Praise God, I'm not the drunk, drug-using, out-of-control maniac. Instead, I'm a saved, born-again, preaching Christian. Gosh, I'm so thankful. But also that I'm not there no more. Because as such were some of you, so was I. Amen. 
And let me say this, I'm no, better, no, I'm no better than, not that I'm better than anybody else, but he changed me. He did it all. I'm so grateful for what he's doing. Listen, team, you don't have to be like them. You don't have to. As such, like some of you, God has changed you too. God has made you different. So be different among them. So you can make a difference among them. Right? I mean, we don't have to be that because we're not that anymore. Here's my statement. We'll close with this. I know it's been a long afternoon. The reason that we can't overcome the Corinthian sins is because when we look in the mirror, we see a Corinthian. The reason you can't get past who you were, every time you look in the mirror, you still see that old filthy, rotten sinner. You're not them. Do you look in the mirror and see yourself as, hey, you were. God, you changed me. I'm different now. I'm not like them. I am different. God, you changed me. And, and, and if you look at this list, and you say, oh my goodness, God, oh my God, Lord, uh, Pastor, listen, on that list you just read off, I've done those. I fall into one of those categories. I've been one of those. I've done that. Listen, we all have. We all did. We were all sinners, but we have all been changed. Be different and make a difference in this city, in this state, in this world, amongst your circle, amongst your family. Be different because you're not them. And you still have, uh, listen, here's my question as, as we close before we, we, we call up the worship team. Are you still living like a Corinthian? You're not them. Rest on the promises that God's done, on the change that he's made in your life, and he has. Are you as living as a Corinthian? Or are you living as if you were a Corinthian? I was. Being different. Be different and make a difference. Amen. Let's stand. As the worship team comes up here, praise God for his goodness. Just worship with us. If you, if you, you want to come to the altar, God, come to the altar, God. If you want to sit there in your seat, praise the Lord. Praise him right there in your seat. Praise him for the fact that he brought you from where he brought you. He changed you. He made you different. And listen, never look down at those. You were such, as such were some of you. God is good all the time. We're not deserving of heaven, and we're not deserving of his grace and his mercy, but God is, is loving towards us. That charity, he forgave us. Maybe you're watching online, hey listen, you don't have to live the way that you used to live. You don't have to be that person that you used to be. You're different now. Why don't you just get with the Lord right now? Just, just, just surrender it to God. Say, I'm tired of living this way. What's God saying to your heart? Was you breathing in my heart? Through the raging storm, would you hold me in your arms? Because I need.
closer than I ever step, closer than I ever breath, closer than the song I sing, closer than anything, closer than my every breath, closer than my every step, closer than the song I sing, closer than So thankful for the Lord and all his goodness. Uh, thank you for talking and watching. Remember, you're not them. Amen. You guys are as you're a Lord. You're a Christian. So live as one. Amen. Thank you for watching.